Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. And become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. I do want to remind you that Great Detectives of Old Time Radio t-shirts are still available. Uh, you can pick one up year-round. Either uh, go to uh, t-shirt.greatdetectives.net to pick up our regular Great Detectives t-shirt. Or go to yours truly.greatdetectives.net to get your copy of our 70th anniversary t-shirt uh, at uh, yours truly.greatdetectives.net. Today's program was one of those episodes that was rebroadcast in 1953 as a summer replacement series. Uh, and this is also an episode where we don't know when the original episode aired. It would have been sometime during the uh, autumn of 1951, but we can't say for sure. Uh, the actual title of this episode, uh, there's not a program that exists uh, f during the original air date, so this could either be a case of an episode that aired on, say, December 27th of 1950, or it could be another episode that's missing and they changed the script. At any rate, the rebroadcast date is September the uh, 13th of 1953, and the title is The Charles Johnson Matter. <laughs> Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, a beauty on the boulevard, a bear cat in the brush. Oh, now, really. Patty? I'm sorry I called. Well, I'm not Lieutenant Levinson. Your voice always reminds me of strained boulders. Look, Rick, you want a job? I refuse to clean up after Otis. You just got to quit feeding him in the office. I've got a guy down here in the tomb. Well, give him some embalming fluid, wrap him in 12 yards of first aid bandage, put a dog at his feet, and call the museum. What? They'll never know the difference. Just an old mummy you ran into when you were out trying to dig up a date. Oh, for Pete's sake. Ah, uh, what's on your mind? This is not exactly official, but I've got a guy down here that I'm holding for the team in. He's screaming that he wants a private detective. A con? Oh, come on, Walt. He's got money. Money? Well, why do you drag out these conversations? I could have been down there by now. Money. According to Webster any particular form of denomination of coin or paper which is lawfully current. According to Diamond, that which makes his little heart go pity-pat and his landlord send voodoo death warnings. Actually, I have certain rules about the people I take money from. First, they've got to have it. Second, they've got to be people. I closed my office and headed to the 5th Precinct where Fatty Levinson, the guiding stomach of the homicide department, showed me down to the tombs where he introduced me to my potential client. A Mr. Charles Johnson, who was sitting in his cell looking very unhappy. Got a visitor, Mr. Johnson. The detective? Yes, this is Mr. Diamond. Go on in, Rick. Yell when you're done. Right. Thanks, Walt. Sure. Sit down, Mr. Diamond. What's your trouble, Johnson? I've been framed. Sure. I was convicted of passing counterfeit money. But you didn't pass it. Oh, certainly. I passed it all right, but I... I, I didn't know I was passing it. Oh, well, then you better tell me the whole thing. Well, it's very simple. For some time, I had evidently been passing bad money. The merchant with whom my wife and I trade told the police that someone had given them counterfeit bills. According to the police, I was finally spotted as the passer. They followed me for several days. And they say I passed bad bills on six different occasions. And you think you've been framed? Mr. Diamond, I have no access to counterfeit money. I'm retired, and I live more than comfortably. I have a great deal of money, Mr. Diamond. Why would I want to pass counterfeit bills? Maybe you hate spending the good stuff. Someone who could have replaced my spending money with the bad bills did so. They even found the counterfeit bills in my safe at home. What about your wife? She was arrested with me. 
she passed some of the bills, and if we hadn't had a good lawyer, she would have been convicted also. Well, how do you get her off? According to the officers, I was the one who gave her the counterfeit bills. There's some law about that. Mm -hmm. Didn't do it of her own free will. This, uh, this lawyer handled your case, too? He's my personal lawyer. Been with me for years. Well, uh, Mr. Johnson, I'd say you were in a tough spot. But I'm innocent. Where do you keep your personal cash? Mostly in the safe. How much? Two or three thousand at all times. Don't pay your bills by check? Never have. Like to pay everything in cash. I'm known for it. Will you try to help me? For a hundred a day in expenses. I have turned over all my money to my wife to be handled by my lawyer. Now, which one do I see? John Forbes, my lawyer. I've already conferred with him. He'll be expecting you. Just tell him you're the detective I hired. The lawyer's address was across town, 554 East 52nd Street, a tall building in the middle of the block, office 511, blonde secretary 52, age 24. I was shown into a richly furnished room, complete with heavy wood paneling and something else in high heels that made me forget the blonde. You're the detective Mr. Johnson has hired? Uh, that's right. Richard P. Diamond, when you get around to writing it on a check. Uh, this is Mr. Johnson's wife. Mr. Johnson, Mr. Diamond. How do you do, Mr. Diamond? Uh, how do you do? Uh, what is your fee, Mr. Diamond? A hundred a day in expenses. Uh, do you think your husband is guilty, Mrs. Johnson? Of course not. He didn't know he was passing that money. How do you think he got the bad bills in his safe? I can't imagine. Mm. How about you, Mr. Forbes? Do you think that Mr. Johnson knew he was passing the counterfeit money? Oh, certainly not. Do you have any theories about it? You're the detective, Mr. Diamond, and quite an expensive one. Yeah, I'm a pig. The kind of case you really love. No clues and no one knew anything. I spent the next hour throwing questions at Forbes and Mrs. Johnson. Result, zero. Forbes had been a member of the state bar for ten years, handled some big accounts. Mrs. Johnson had met her husband in Florida three years before. About 15 years younger, but completely happy. But there was one little thing that kept nagging at me. According to Forbes, Johnson had a cool million. And that took me right back to the reason I'd gotten interested. Why would a man like that pass phony bills? I got a substantial retainer and checked back with Walt. Rick, I got an idea. Maybe Johnson wanted his wife out of the way. So he tried to frame her by giving her the bad money, hoping she'd get caught. Instead, he got caught. The gag backfired. So he slipped a tour in plain sight of everyone. Well, it's possible. At this point, anything's possible. By the way, did you find out anything about those counterfeit bills? Yeah, I checked with the treasury men. They told me that during the trial, they identified the work. The engraving was done by Leon Fisher. Ooh, one of the best counterfeiters in the business a long time ago. Is he in or out of prison? He's out. You remember when we sent him up the last time? Oh, <laughs> do I? I was playing stickball in Knickers the last time Fisher went up the river. It was only 15 years ago, Peter Pan. Okay, so I date myself. He's been out for 10 years. I remember now. Happy Methuselah? <laughs> Say, wasn't Fisher picked up once after he got out for trying to pass some more of the stuff? Yeah, 10 years ago, but got off. Not enough evidence then. But the Treasury Department's looking for him now. Oh, thanks, Walt. You still think you can do something for your client? I don't know, but I did just have a thought. If Johnson kept passing his stuff for a week or so, he must have been pretty stupid not to recognize it. You don't remember Fisher very well. He was a real artist. His stuff could fool the U.S. Treasury unless they examined the paper. Well, now I had one lead. An old-time counterfeiter named Leon Fisher. Swell lead. Even the Treasury Department didn't know where to find him. But in my business, I could use a couple of gimmicks the team men couldn't. I left the phone booth and headed for the Lower East Side, and a gentleman known for his dubious ability with a paintbrush and his gifts of underworld knowledge, providing the price was right. Yes, who is knocking, please? Vladimir? But there must be some mistake. The name is Mabel. Oh, stop making like a floor door, girl. It's Diamond. The detective? Well, certainly. Open up. Who you are working for? It's not your landlord. Greenblatt, the butcher? You don't even know him. Know him, schmow him. Do I owe him? No. Comrade. Now, I need some information, Vladimir. I could paint your portrait while we talk. For you, a magnificent oil painting of your wonderful face. Only $50. I haven't got time. A quick charcoal, $25? No. Hand-painted ties? 
A small statue of a snowbound Cossack, stolen personally from the Tsar's private collection. No. Cheap. Where can I find Leon Fisher? You can't afford the snowbound Cossack and you are interested in Leon Fisher? Fisher fits my collection. Wasn't he somewhat of an artist himself? Twenty bucks. A fellow artist. Thirty. Probably starving, like myself. Forty. Such a talent not to be really appreciated. Fifty. Last price. Last price. You know me pretty well by now. Sixty. Goodbye, Vladimir. Wait. He's living in an old shack on 14 River Street. Goes under by the name Peters. Peters the artist? Uh, Peters the peasant. Fifty dollars, please. And I promise you no part of it will ever reach Northern Korea. Headed for 14 River Street and a Mr. Leon Fisher, alias one Mr. Peters. The first lead in the whole mess, but very likely to have nothing at all to do with my client, Mr. Johnson. 14 River Street was just as Vladimir had described it, and a little more so. An old shack, all right. Very possibly the oldest, also the dirtiest on the river. Yeah? Your name Peters? Yeah. Mind if I come in? Yeah, you smell like a cop. Well, if I was, I'd have called you Fisher. Come on in. Sit down. Thanks. What's on your mind? Some money. Oh, you sure came to the right place, but we don't open until 10 o'clock in the morning. Got a time lock on the vault. The Treasury Department is looking for you. Why? Some of your portraits of our presidents have found their way back into circulation. I don't know what you're talking about. They got the plates when they sent you up the last time 15 years ago, but they never got the money. Remember? I still don't know what you're talking about. 15 years might make a guy think the heat's off. Get out of here. You know a man named Johnson? I don't know anybody you know or anything about money or plates. Now, beat it. I can make a quick call to the team, man. You got the wrong boy. Beat it. Boy? Let me tell you something. I was playing stickball with... Oh, forget it. He was Fisher, all right, no doubt about it. But I didn't have enough information or the authority to sweat it out of him. It was getting dark when I left and headed for a phone, keeping an eye on the shack in case Fisher decided to skip. I was halfway down the block when I heard it. Oh, no. The shot had come from the direction of Fisher's shack, so I took off like an overstimulated cabbie. Suicide didn't figure. Fisher was lying in the middle of the floor. The slug had caught him high in the chest, and he was dying fast. Suicide? Not a bit. No time to wait around and get mixed up with a lot of questions about Fisher's death I couldn't answer anyway. So I called Walt and gave him the story. A fast cab and a buck eighty later, I was going through the morgue files in my favorite newspaper. Here's some more stuff on Lee and Fisher, Mr. Diamond. Thanks, Charlie, but I, uh, I think I found what I want. Yeah? Yeah, right here. The last time they picked him up, got off clean as a whistle. Yeah. Says they caught him passing a counterfeit bill. The witnesses say they saw another man giving it to him. According to this, the other man was a two-bit hood, wanted for everything in the books. He went to prison denying he ever gave Fisher the bills, but there were witnesses. Pretty smart lawyer to get Fisher off when he was a known counterfeiter. Even if witnesses did say they saw another hood slip in the money. Very smart lawyer. Fisher was shot with a 32, Rick. Uh, slugs and ballistics now. The killer didn't leave any footprints because of that rocky shoreline behind the shack. Well, now we know from Fisher before he died that the killer was the one who took the counterfeit money. You said Fisher told you he was forced to give up the money. The killer must have had something on Fisher. I found something in the newspaper morgue that might interest you, Walt. The last time Fisher was sent to trial for passing counterfeit money, he got off. That's right. You know how he got off? No, I can't remember exactly. Had a good lawyer. The lawyer used a loophole in the law. Had witnesses who swore someone else gave Fisher the bad bill. Hey, that's the same gimmick Johnson's lawyer used to get the wife off. Same gimmick, same lawyer. What? Now, the lawyer who represented Fisher ten years ago was a struggling criminal attorney named Forbes, John Forbes. Now, representing Johnson, the man you've got locked up downstairs. Well, I'll be... If he fixed that witness ten years ago for Fisher, that could be the club he used to make Fisher give him the old counterfeit money. Now, he could have followed me, seen me go into 
See Fisher, listened outside, and killed him after I left. I'll have him picked up. No, no, wait a minute. Where's your motive? Well, he's now handling Johnson's money, a million bucks. That's motive enough to frame anyone. Yeah, but two things throw that out. Forbes is supposedly a very successful lawyer, and he only controls Johnson's money through his wife. Well, maybe she's in on it with him. That's a possibility. Either that or there's a way for Forbes to get the money without her knowing it. Could be. Now, first, we've got to find out how he handles Mrs. Johnson's money, and then we've got to find out if he really is as successful as he appears. I still think we better have a talk with Mr. Johnson. You know, I think you're right. Have you found out anything, Mr. Diamond? Got some pretty good hunches, Johnson. Tell me, how does the arrangement work with your money concerning your lawyer and your wife? Uh, Mr. Forbes gives my wife whatever money he considers necessary, according to his judgment. Do you Hmm? trust his judgment, Mr. Johnson? Of course. Financially successful? Of course. Just my yearly retainer alone would help him to live quite comfortably. No bad investments? Not that I know of. When he gives your wife the money, can he just write a check or make a withdrawal? Not without my wife's counter-signature. Where Hmm. did you meet your wife? In Florida. Three years ago. Your wife and Forbes are very good friends? Well, the very best. Oh, now, wait a minute. You don't think... I don't know. I don't know. But I'll let you know if I come up with something. I was getting close. Forbes knew Fisher, the counterfeiter. Very possibly knew he had the counterfeit money stashed under the old shack. He'd gotten Fisher off ten years before, and he could have framed the case and forced Fisher to give him the counterfeit on the strength of it. The countersigned checks almost definitely showed the wife to be in on it but I still needed a motive. The one thing I had to prove, that Forbes was not as successful as he was supposed to have been, and that he needed cash, and also that Mrs. Johnson wanted to frame her husband and help Forbes. It was 8 o'clock when Walt and I piled into the squad car and headed for the home of John Forbes. At 8.30, we parked across the street a half a block away. At 9.15, we spotted Forbes leaving by his front door. We followed him east across town where he pulled up in front of 705 East 46th Street and went in. Ten minutes to ten, he came out again. But this time, he wasn't alone. On his arm, still looking very interesting in high heels and topped off with a Nerman wrap. Mrs. Johnson. Yeah, a million bucks in that. Makes a guy wonder about that old adage, crime doesn't pay. Ten o'clock and on the outskirts of town heading across the river for Jersey. Walt, uncomfortable about leaving his territory but interested enough to keep on tailing. 10.30, and we pulled up in front of a big building in Jersey. They're going in. Yeah, Carlos Droka's country club. Dinner with a side order of roulette. Good place for any guy to lose his money. They're uh, taking a table in the supper room. There's a gambling room in the back. Maybe they just need some energy. Look, Forbes is getting up. Face the bar, he's headed this way. Hey, he's headed for Droker's office. Yeah, I know Droker pretty well. Did him a favor once. When Forbes comes out, I think I'll go in. Well, it's good to see you again, Ricky. Good you come around and pay me a visit. How you been, huh? All right, Droker. Haven't got much time. Oh, business, huh? I was hoping you'd stick around, play the wheel. Who knows you might win something? On your wheel? Well, that's why you might win something, because it's my wheel. <laughs> mm. You uh, want to do me a favor? You've done me a couple. I don't forget. Well, the guy who was just in here, John Ford. No, no, I can't knock him off for you, Ricky. He's too good a customer. Good customer loses a lot, huh? Uh, yeah. Forbes, one of the best customers I got. Pays up? Yeah, most of the time. Never got to a point where he couldn't? Only once I had to put the pressure on him. Only once. Oh, I see. But he paid up. Yeah. I gave him 60 days. How much was it, and when did he pay it? 15000 and he paid it 10 minutes ago. He's going in to lose some more. Uh, one more question. Did he give you check or cash? Uh, cash. You know something, Ricky? What would guys like me do if there weren't guys like that or huh? With the guys like you around, there'll always be guys like that around. <laughs> Goodbye, Ricky. Goodbye. <laughs> Having a little snort, Fatty? (laughs) You did it again. You always do it. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Tell me, are Forbes and Mrs. Johnson still in the gambling room? Yeah. No, we were right. 
Forbes has been losing his money to Droga. Oh, there's the motive. Let's pick them up. No, no, wait, wait. I want to nail him for sure on the Fisher killing. Now, if we pick them both up now, they'll have time to think about it, get the story straight. Well, what do you want to do? We'll work on Mrs. Johnson, but let her alone until the bank's open. Why until the bank's open? Well, Forbes paid Droga 15000 cash. I want to see if Mrs. Johnson cashed a check for that amount. If she did, we'll pick her up, but not Forbes. I want him to think he's safe until we break down Mrs. Johnson. See you tomorrow, Fatty. Right. Morning, Walt. Hi, Rick. I got Mrs. Johnson in the other room, and she's screaming for her lawyer. Mm. What about the bank? You were right. Notice called in about five minutes ago. The bank cashed a check yesterday morning signed by Forbes and Mrs. Johnson for $15,000. How about Forbes? Had Collins watching him all night. He'll pick him up when we need him. Uh, okay, let's uh, go to work on Mrs. Johnson. Okay. Notice. Yeah, Lieutenant. Bring in Mrs. Johnson. Right, Lieutenant. You just gonna come right out and accuse her of it? No, no. Just a little friendly chat. Mrs. Johnson, Lieutenant. Come in, Mrs. Johnson. Of this, Lieutenant? How are you this morning, uh, Mrs. Johnson? None of your business. I demand to know what have right you have. Have a seat. Mrs. Not until Johnson. I have an explanation. Have a nice time last night, Mrs. Johnson? Why, uh, yes, I had a wonderful time. My attorney, Mr. Forbes, took me to dinner. Anything wrong with that? Went to Jersey, didn't you? I understand you followed me. Nice place, Drucker's Restaurant. I see. Yes, a very nice place, Mr. Diamond. Win anything gambling? I lost. Are you going to arrest me for gambling? How'd Mr. Forbes make out? He won a little, but I don't see what business... Won a little, is... huh? Well, for him, that's a change. What do you mean? Well, according to Droker, Mr. Forbes has been losing heavily for some time. I wouldn't know. What Mr. Forbes does with his money is not my concern. He paid Droker a $15,000 gambling debt last night. Did he? I understand you cashed a check for that amount yesterday morning. All right, what about it? You uh, have the combination to your husband's safe? Of course, that's where I keep my jewelry. Does Mr. Forbes... I don't think so. That is... I don't know. Nice-looking guy, Forbes. Mr. Diamond, I don't know what you're getting at, but this is absurd. Until last night, Forbes was too broke to pay off his debt to drop. All right, supposing I gave Mr. Forbes the money. Is there anything wrong with that? I don't know. Wonder what your husband would say. It was a loan. Hey, excuse me. You know something, yeah? Mrs. Johnson? We think your husband was framed. We think someone put phony bills in his safe so he'd get caught yeah, passing right. them. Right. A uh, rank. Uh, excuse me, Mrs. Johnson. McCarthy's been tailing Forbes. Says Forbes just purchased a ticket to Rio. One ticket? Yeah. If he's on such a gravy train, why well, pull out a loan? Maybe he got more than the 15000 Uh, Mrs. Johnson, we think John Forbes framed your husband so he could get money out of you. That's utterly ridiculous. And for a while, we thought you were in on it because the checks had to be co-signed. Well, I hope you've changed your mind. Oh, I guess we have to. Why would Forbes leave for South America if he was planning on getting money from you? Leave? One ticket for Rio. I don't believe you. Oh, check if you want to. Well, it doesn't make any difference to me. When's he leaving? He already has. No. No, he couldn't. Why not? Just a trip, probably. He'll be back. He couldn't be. Oh, he's desperate. All right, Mr. Diamond. I signed over a power of attorney this morning so he could liquidate a half million in negotiable securities. I was supposed to be on that plane with him. Let's go pick him up. Pick him up? I thought you said he'd already left. Oh, shame on me for fibbing. I guess I just isn't going to go to heaven. Come on, Walt. Yes? Mind if we come in, Forbes? Oh, the private detective. And uh, Lieutenant Levinson. We've met. Well, I'm sorry, gentlemen, but I'm very busy. Oh, packing, eh? Well, Rio's nice this time of year. Yes. Well, uh, come in if you like. Just go right ahead. We won't bother you. All right, boys. What's on your minds? Well, we just had a talk with Mrs. Johnson. She told us everything. What do you mean, everything? She's a little unhappy about you skipping with those securities. Oh? You, uh, don't mind if I finish my packing? Well, go right ahead. 
But we really couldn't see our way clear to letting you take a trip if you had those securities. No? Makes it look like you might have framed Johnson for his money. What did you do? Make his wife fall in love with you and then talk her into it? I'm afraid I don't know what you're talking about. How about Leon Fisher, the counterfeiter you cleared back in 39? I haven't seen him since then. We better take a look in that bag. No, Lieutenant. Hold it right there. Put it down, Forbes. You can't get both of us. I don't think you're willing to take a chance on it. We're ten feet apart. You try for the lieutenant, I go for my gun. And if I try for you? Walt. (laughs) Okay. Awful close. Yeah. What's in the bag? I'll take a look. See how Forbes is. Well, well. Securities and a bundle of dough. All counted. I guess he figured he could unload it if things got tough. How is he? Dead. But don't worry about it, Walt. A guy like Forbes spent his time figuring out so many crooked angles for other people. Sooner or later, he had to trip over one and break his own neck. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. This is Bill Foreman speaking. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Welcome back. Well, that was an interesting part where the informant with the Russian accent promised Diamond that his uh, money for information wouldn't go to North Korea. Other than that, uh, this was a pretty straightforward Richard Diamond case, though with a limited appearance by Sergeant Otis and no appearance by Helen. So that was a little disappointing, but it's always great to hear an episode of Richard Diamond we haven't heard before. So I hope you enjoyed that. Now we turn to listener comments and feedback. Stephen writes in that as a Canadian academic who specializes in World War II literature and a fan of the great detectives, I will be interested in your series, The War. I'm about to embark on it. Well, thank you so much, Stephen, and uh, I wish you all the best uh, listening to it, uh, and I hope you uh, get as much out of the series as I did. It was uh, incredible to listen to, and if you're interested in World War II, I encourage you to check it out. Go to thewar.greatdetectives.net. I do want to thank our Patreon of the day. 
Thank you to Russell, who has been one of our Patreon supporters uh, since October 2016 and is currently supporting us at the Shamus level of $4 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support. All right, well, that will do it for today. Join us back here tomorrow for uh, Rocky Jordan, and uh, then we will be back next Tuesday with uh, Let George Do It. In the meantime, send your comments to Box13 at GreatDetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.